Although he was born without legs from a congenital birth defect, Blake Leeper has never allowed that to prevent him from winning in sports. When Leeper was a teenager, he watched South African sprinter Oscar Pistorius in the 2008 Paralympics in Beijing. It triggered in him a deep desire to run. I was just like shocked and I was amazed. I was like, wow, there's something for me. And they and it was, you know, the crowd of Beijing was 90,000 people and they was cheering and it was just it was just a spark of inspiration that was planted with them inside of me that even though I never ran track and field a day in my life, I just felt new like that's what I need to do in my life. Lieber began racing in 2010. Since then, he has become an eight-time Paralympic track and field international medalist. He holds many world records, including the sixth fastest runner in the world in the 400-meter dash. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Raghavan, and this is When It Mattered. This episode is brought to you by Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups find their narrative. I'm joined today by Blake Leeper, who at age 26 has ambitious goals to become one of the fastest runners in the world. But Leeper is struggling to compete in the Paralympics and get accepted into the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. International racing authorities say his running blades give him an unfair height and speed advantage over able-bodied runners. It's a fight he's determined to win. Blake, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor and a pleasure. And just thank you so much for allowing me to share my story and just, you know, some of the things I've been through in my life that allow me to be in the situation that, that I am in today. You were born with this extraordinary challenge of being a double amputee, yet you've never let it get in the way. How did you overcome those early years of adversity to start participating both in sports and in life? Yeah, I mean, I really give it to my parents, you know, my family members. I, yeah, I grew up in East Tennessee and I had, you know, I had an older brother, and but I had, you know, grandparents and, you know, grandmothers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles. And of course, my mother and my father and just you know their mindset of just saying yes we have a disabled child but we're going to give him everything that we got and we're going to allow him to live a fulfilled life you know I asked my parents every single time like what was it like the day that I was born you know that you know the doctors rushed me out the room they brought me back they had the conversation you know Mr. And Mrs. Leaker I'm sorry but your your baby boy is born missing both of his legs you know and I, and I asked my mom like, mom what'd you say you're you know dad that who'd you hit, right? Like, I know you didn't take that. And, you know, they give me the same answer over and over and over again. They said, Blake, you know, the day that you was born, we was nervous because they rushed you out the room and took you to ICU, but they eventually brought you back. And once they brought you back, we didn't see what you was missing. We didn't notice that. We seen the beauty inside of you. And in that moment, we decided to do two things. And the first thing we're going to do is stick together as a family, as a unit. And the, and the second answer was, we're going to keep a positive attitude towards the whole situation. And, and that's something that was instilled in me at an early age since day one. That's absolutely beautiful. But I'm sure as a young child, you know, you had to overcome that huge mental and emotional and physical block of uh, A, being different from everybody around you and B, getting accepted into sports and activities. How, it must have been super difficult. How did you get over that? Oh, I mean, ab absolutely. You know, being in, I mean, especially in my community, I was the only probably disabled child, especially with prosthetic legs and and me trying to figure it out, trying to fit in, you know, trying to figure out girlfriends and, and, and trying to figure out life, trying to figure out why I was born without legs. I, I, I remember when I was playing t-ball, you know, I was like baseball for when I was like five or six, seven years old. And I wanted to hit a home run and I hit the ball as far as I can. And, and, and I run to first base and on my way to first to second, then like my teammates are cheering. And, you know, I was really excited because my dad was the third base coach and I really want to make him proud and fit in with the, with the team because, you know, they, they talked about me and I was made fun of sometimes. And on my way to second to third, my leg falls off. And, and, the, and the kid comes over and, and, and tags me out. And I look over to my, my teammates and all the excitement's gone. And, you know, my dad, I can tell he was disappointed, not at me, but the situation. And, you know, he, you know, as he came over to pick me up, I remember being mad at the world, one leg on, one leg off, inning over, like asking, why me? Like, why has this happened to me? I don't get this. Like my brother has his legs, my mom. She has her legs. My dad has his legs. Like, but what I realized as I got older and more trial and tribulations that I, that I went through, I realized everything happens for a reason. And, and the reality of it is, like, I, instead of asking, saying, why me? I started asking, saying, well, why not me? I'm meant for this. Well, why not me? I'm strong enough for this. And just keeping that perception, that perspective, that all my trials and tribulations that I'm facing and, and saying that my adversity is my advantage. And so you started playing all kinds of sports, right? Yes. Yes. 
yes, I played baseball. I played basketball. Um, I ran a little bit of cross country in, in middle school, but I, I really fell in love with baseball and basketball as a child. But it wasn't until I was in college until I started running track and field. And and so tell me about that moment when you saw Oscar Pistorius, the the South African sprinter in the Beijing uh, Paralympics in 2008. You know, he, he had these futuristic running blades. And uh, I don't know if you were wearing something similar at the time, but what was that like watching him run? Yeah, it, it was amazing. You know, I was I can remember I was in my college dorm room, you know, on the college diet, eat my, my bowl of Fruit Loops. And Oscar Pistorius comes on, pops up on ESPN. I was there to watch the basketball highlights. And he, you know, he popped up and it was just highlighting the 2008, you know, Beijing Paralympic Games in a bird's nest and he took a gold gold medal in 100 meters, 200 meters and the 400 meters. And they were saying, I was like, look how this man born without legs. You know, I felt like it was talking about me, but some, you know, but it was talking about him, of course. And I was just like shocked and I was amazed. I was like, wow, there's something for me. And they, and it was, you know, the crowd of Beijing was 90,000 people and they was cheering and it was just, it was just a spark of inspiration that was planted with them inside of me that even though I never ran track and field a day in my life, I just felt new, like that's what I need to do with my life. Like that's what it's about. I played sports my whole life, but I was still searching to try to figure out what, you know, what my passion truly was and why I was really meant to do in my life on this earth. And once I seen that, that was like the inspiration and the passion that, that was sparked inside of me to, to pursue this. So what did you do next? How did you actually start running? And what was that like that first time you you tried to do that? Yeah, it, I mean, it was a process of just emailing people and emailing people. These running legs are, are pretty expensive. You know, insurance does, do not cover running blades because they consider it as a luxury and not a necessity, unfortunately. So they can range from ten to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to $30,000 just for a pair of running legs. So I had to reach out to a lot of people to ask for some funding and donations. And, and of course, I heard a lot of no's, but I still stayed at it. I still stayed at it. And then I sent a, a Paralympic friend of mine an email on MySpace. And he reached out, connected me with a, a nonprofit out of San Diego Challenge Athletes Foundation. And they, they sponsored it and, and, and bought my first pair of legs, which was pretty amazing. And I'll never forget when I, when I first got them, my process who put them together. He did his research, he put them together, and he gave me this long speech. Like, it's, it's going to take almost about three to four months for you to start running on these legs because they're, they're so high tech, they're so new, you never had them before. And I finally get them, we go to the track, and I, I walk the, the curve for the first time on them, trying to figure it out. And by the time I was on the straightaway, I was sprinting. And you have to understand, being born without legs, that's, that's the fastest I ever ran in my life. And I was 18 years old. And the way the wind was hitting my face, just nothing mattered in that moment. I didn't care that I was disabled. I didn't care I was missing my legs. I didn't care what I was dealing with the school or class or, or life issues. Just I was free. Like in that moment, I was free. And I fell in love with that feeling. I really did. And when you, when you look at those blades, you know, it's astonishing what you can do with them. But initially, was it hard to sort of trust those blades? Because they are extremely heuristic and very space agey and new age. You know, it's just amazing to look at and beautiful. But must be hard to sort of let go and say, okay, I trust these blades. Yeah, and actually people don't realize it's a process. You know, as, you know, I get used to the blades, you know, I, I get better on the blades, of course, and maybe I get faster. But as I get faster, people don't realize it's something that's attached to me. I'm not really feeling the ground. And so when I'm getting up to 18, 19 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, it's a, it's a huge trust factor on this technology hoping that it would do its job so I won't hurt myself. And there has been times where I've been at top end speed in a race and a leg falls off. Right? Or there has been times I've been at practice, you know, and it's raining and I slip because I don't have the, the right footing. And I, and I think that's unfortunate. That's something that people don't really consider when they kind of look at my situation. Like that's in the back of my mind at all times when I'm running that at any moment, you know, the technology can fail me and hopefully it won't. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not a hundred percent guaranteed. And did you have to undergo kind of special training and kind of a regimen that helped you cross the chasm from running to winning? Yes. You know, honestly, it was how I try to explain to people. And for me, how my life was, was broken down when I like, when I first got my blades and or my running legs and I was kind of in college, it was like running was a hobby for me. You know, it was something I did. I went to class, I, I did it on the side and I, I did the best I can. It was fun. Um, then I moved to San Diego to the Olympic Training Center. And then once I moved to the Olympic Training Center it became, in San Diego, it became a job for me. And, and it, with that being a job, you know, I took it more serious and I was around other Olympians. And, and it, it was like I learned a lot and I knew how it was important. But there was times I was kind of ready to clock out. I really didn't want to be there. You know, there's 
there's moments where some people are like, we don't want to be here at work. You don't want to be at a job, but you do your job to get the job done. And But then here recently, with these past couple of years, I moved to L.A. And, and once I moved to L.A., I made track and field my life. And, and once I made it my life and, and dedicated it, and, and put everything I can possibly put into it Monday through Sunday, not, not a job that I clock in, I clock out. I'm, I'm constantly thinking about it, trying to better myself um, and trying to figure out how I can be the best in the world. Once I made that commitment, that's when I became good to great. That's when I became, you know, just an average Paralympic runner to the sixth fastest man in the world, legs or no legs. Like that was the, that was the decision and the light switch that switched for me. Your parents, you talked about how when you were a baby and, you know, just born and the doctor broke the news to them and then they see you running and then winning. Have they ever sort of shared with you what that moment was like and how it's been for them to see that transition? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Just like, it's, it's crazy that those moments where, you know, the doctors came in and told my parents I would never walk. I would never walk. And here I am competing at like national championships and Olympic games and Paralympic games in front of thousands and millions of people running, right? And that's just a, you know, for, for me, you know, my parents' faith is, is really strong. It's a true testament to God and, and, the, and the faith that they had and, and the belief saying that, you know, maybe we was dealt with a tough situation, but if you, if you believe and, and overcome and come together, then you can, you can overcome any situation. I'll never forget when it was, I was in London when I won my silver and bronze. It was my mother, my father, and it was um, my grandmother, my uncle, my, and two aunts, and my grandfather, my dad's dad. And for him, he was 72 years old, and it was the first time he ever flew to London, or ever, ever flew ever in his life. And his first flight was to London. <laughs> so when I asked him, <laughs> so I asked him, I was like, Granddad, if I make the, if I, I call him Papa, I was like, Papa, if I make the, the Paralympic team, will you, will you come watch me run? He's like, yeah, of course I will. He said, where, where is it at? I was like, it's in London. He's like, okay, okay, how far is that drive? I was like, I was like, I was like, Papa, we, we have to fly. He's like, okay, okay, we have to fly. He's like, do they serve alcohol in the plane? I was like, yeah, yeah, they do. They do, Papa. So we got Papa <laughs> drunk and took him over to London. But it was amazing because after I won my, my silver, my bronze, I told my family to meet me at a certain part of the stadium. And, and it, one of my biggest races was a, you know, 200 meter race with, it was like 86,000 people, you know, in the stands and 11 million people watching. Oscar was in the race and, and, and I, I took the bronze medal and I run over there to my family after I, I get my medal and I hug my, my dad, my, my mom and, and my grandmother, and my aunt. But, but I can't find granddad. And granddad's in a corner and he's crying like a two-year-old baby. I mean, just crocodile tears just coming down his face. And, and for me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 21 years old and that's the first time I've ever seen my grandfather cry. And, and it wasn't tears of sadness. It was just tears of joy just because you have to understand it was not only his, my last name, you know, and, you know, being spoke about, but that was his last name. And I could just tell all that, you know, animosity and, and worry that he's had, you know, having a disabled grandson, you know, and seeing this moment just like was like just like a moment of, of clarity for him saying he's going to be OK, you know, and, 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 I, and I take that moment and I embed it in, inside of me because I use that as fuel when I'm when I'm training. Or when I'm going through tough times or when I, you know, I have, you know, big goals or ambitions to, to try to push the limits. And I think, you know, he, he fought for me when I couldn't fight for myself, right? And, and, you know, he prayed for me when I couldn't pray for myself. He loved me when there was times I couldn't love myself. So at bare minimum, the least that I can do is not give up, right? Just out of respect for him, the least I can do is to keep fighting, keep pursuing my dreams and, and keep making him proud. And did you say Oscar Pistorius was in that race? Yes, he was. That was actually the race he lost, the 200 meter race that he lost to the Brazilian that year. And so there were two of you on running blades. That must have been just an incredible sight and story. Ah, oh, man. And, and you know, that was just amazing because Storage did run in the Olympic Games that year and him running in the Olympic Games and coming back to the Paralympic Games and just, you know, the spotlight and, and you know, the crowd and, and just the, the energy and just how London treated the, the disabled athletes were just it was just truly amazing it was a once in a lifetime experience it's incredible to watch you even when you're in training I watched some of your YouTube videos and and I saw you on the treadmill running how <laughs> fast were you going <laughs> so on that treadmill run um I, w I w was able to uh, go up to 25 miles per hour that's stunning 
yeah. So if I was in a, a school zone, I might get it. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a quick rundown of your most uh, important medals and records to date. Yeah. So medals wise, my most important medals would, would definitely have to be my silver, my bronze, the Paralympic Games. And that's just because, you know, that's my first one. My family was there. Of course, my stories was in the races. It was just a, a highlighted moment. It was just, I was 21, you know, just young. It's just the experience and just being there was amazing. Records wise, though, definitely would have to be within these past two years. Um, and that was be the 400 meter world record that I broke in. At first, it was Oscar's world record that he had at 45.35. And I broke that in 2017 um, at the US ATF National Outdoor Championships. And when I did that, I became the first double leg amputee ever to compete at an able body national championship event, which I, I think it was just a true testament that anything is truly possible. And then I came back this year at the same national championships was just two years later. And I broke my, my world record and ran 44, three, eight in the 400 meters and qualified for the finals and took fifth overall and qualified for world championships. What was the race where you lost a leg in the final part of the race and you actually won? <laughs> <laughs> that was in 2016. Yeah, that was in 2016. I was running hundred meters and I, I got out and, I, and there was a guy in front of me and I was trying to go get him. And we was like getting to the eight, 70, 80, into the 90. And I got to almost like 90, 95. And it's like I looked down and my leg was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a moment I was like, uh-oh, this is not going to be good at all. And then I just started falling and I, and I tumbled across the line and just had to tuck and roll. And as I rolled, there was another kid on the other side, on the right side. He's missing both of his legs. And he seen, and he seen me fall. So he, and I fell in his lane. So he had to jump over me and his blades. And it's just, it was, and my leg is just like flying all over the place in the background. It was it like a car crash. <laughs> but you were okay. Yeah, I was fine. I was fine. It was just a blown time. And did you win? No, I took second. I took second that race. <laughs> almost though, almost. So do you, uh, uh, the, the running blades that you wear, you wear them just for running or do you wear them all the time? No, just mostly for running. And, and that's the cool thing with prosthetics and with the industry that where it's at today. I, I have multiple pair of legs where I, I, when I'm sprinting and running, I, I, I use my blades. And when I'm you know driving or walking around, Throughout the community, I have I have a pair, and even a, even a pair if I'm playing basketball or doing, you know, just different workouts and, and or CrossFit or just whatever the task may may be at hand, and, and whatever it is, like with a, a screwdriver, I can switch it out, or you know, really quick and, and get the job done. And and that's the amazing part about it. You know what I mean? I love my what I love about my life is like that. You know, I have so many opportunities, and that's my message. It's like you know, whatever situation that you're in, you know, if, you, if you're missing your leg or you are disabled or whatever. There's so many tools and, and, and resources out there. If you really go search for it and, and really have the ambition and drive, you can. I, I have a, a good deep feeling that you can find it and, and live for your life to the fullest. Because this wasn't around back in the day, and, and, and my life would be totally different if I, if I was born, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, before now. Well, you've also, I mean, you're sounding very positive and optimistic, but you've also run into a, a number of obstacles throughout your career, and especially in recent years in competing both in the Paralympics and in getting your name in the hat for the 2020 Summer Olympics coming up in Tokyo. And even though you've actually been competing in a number of races, some of those points haven't even been officially entered. So tell us, what are the issues that you're dealing with uh, for both the Paralympics and the Olympics? What's what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, I got a lot going on. So so even though I'm running these times and I'm competing against able-bodied athletes and I'm breaking Paralympic world records and, and you know, I claim the title as the fastest amputee in the world, unfortunately, the Olympic Committee, the IAAF, feels like I have an unfair advantage because I use the blades. And kind of the, the same battle that stories kind of went through the last time. It's just 10 years later, and I'm running a, a second and a half faster. Um, so, and, and it's kind of unfortunate because, you know, I trained so hard, and I've dedicated my life to this, and I've made so many sacrifices, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I overcame so much to, to be in this position. And it's finally, like, I ran, and once I ran the time, they say I have a, like I have an unfair advantage. And the unfortunate part with the, with the difference is now between Pistorius and me, because a lot of people ask, well, well, Pistorius ran, why, can, why can't you not run? And I don't understand. And because the, the burden of proof has been switched. So when Pistorius was com competing and, and qualified for the, the Olympic Games in 2012, the burden of proof was on the Federation. Now me, as they, they switched it, and now me, the athlete, um, has to prove my burden uh, that I do not gain an unfair advantage. And, and honestly, I, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> I, I do not know. You know, I have a, a great legal team that's on it right now, um, Winston and Straw, and they're, they're doing a, a, a great job. You know, I ask them, and you know, I, I go to them, you know, can I help with, uh, trying to break down? And what can I do? What do you need me to do? And, and they give me the same answer over and over again. They say, Blake, train. Your job is to train, and your job is to run fast. And if you do that job, we'll do our job. And, and just trust us, and we'll trust in you. And then that's what I've been doing. You know, I'm, I'm preparing myself. To, to, to be the fastest man in the world, legs or no legs. That's my mindset. Like, I want to really do this. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've took some lumps and bumps and, and, and been through adversity, and I'm, I'm still here standing. So I feel like I'm here for a reason, and, and I'm going to train as hard as I possibly can train. So eventually the approval is going to come. I, I have full confidence that I will get approved. And once that approval comes, I want to be mentally, spiritually, and physically ready to be an Olympic champion. And you've got the same lawyers that represented Oscar Pistorius. Yes, yes. And I have the same lawyers that represent Oscar Pistorius and they, they won the case for Pistorius and that got him to run in the 2012 um, Olympic Games. So that's, I'm, I'm, I have confidence. I have, I have full confidence. And, and, and on, at the end of the day, people ask like, well, what happened if you didn't get to run in the Olympics? Or, you know, what would happen if it doesn't work out in your favor? And, and, and that, that would be upsetting. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, ah, oh, I'll be fine. Like I would be upset. But at the end of the day, I was born without legs and the Olympic committee feels like I have an unfair advantage in running. <laughs> do you think you do? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I really don't. No, and, and, and what I'm trying to explain to people, like, you know, walk a mile in my shoes. I, I would tell people, walk a mile in my legs. If people understand the things that I, I go through as a, as a double leg amputee, just to even get to the track. You know, there's days my legs are swollen, my stumps are swollen, they're bleeding, they're sore, they get infections. I mean, some, sometimes I can't even run. Some, some days it just doesn't work out for me. And, and for me, I'm just like, if it was that easy, if it was really that easy to run so fast, because if you have an unfair advantage, it should be easy because that's what the advantage is for. If it was that easy, you would see a lot more runners or athletes or people cutting their legs off and, and getting the blades to compete at a high level. So is it true? Now, for the Paralympics, you're dealing with a different issue, and that's the issue of the height of your blades, right? So what's, what's going on there? Yes. So I've been running at the, this height um, for the past 10 years when I first kind of got into the Paralympic Games, and this is the the same high regulation that Pistorius abided by to run in the 2012 Paralympic Games and Olympic Games. Um, so for me to compete, I've developed years and years and years of testing and, and R&D and muscle strength and, and, and muscle memory to, to run fast at this height. The Paralympics have now broken up the classes between the, the single leg and the double leg amputees and re, revised the height regulation that changes my height dramatically that, that's incorrect, incorrect and they're not backing up their data. So you now you have athletes that are 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, that would normally be 5'11", 6 foot. Um, and you also have athletes who've had their legs and uh, have lost them through an accident and now came back to compete. And they're shorter through this new height regulation than they were when they had their legs. So you're not even competing in Paralympics at the moment? Unfortunately, I am not because it's dangerous for me to, to make a, a drastic change like that. I could make a change like that and injure myself and that could put me out for both so you're just going to wait and see what happens are you challenging that um as of right now I'm, my focus is on the olympic games there are some athletes that that are trying to to bring shed light to this not benefiting at all like they're you know they're you know they're losing their sponsorships they're, they're losing funding they're not they're missing out on teams because they're they're being singled out so in every way the burden is is being placed on the on the on the athlete on it on the athlete and, and that's the unfortunate part on both sides is is uh, you get so you now you got you put all this as an athlete my goal is to train to be the fastest person I, I could be to represent my country and even though especially as a paralympian funding is is low as it is already and and now you're asking an athlete to put another burden on them to try to compete and be the best athlete that they possibly can be. So I mean, in terms of funding, endorsements, are they completely radically different than what able-bodied athletes are able to get? I mean, do you get endorsements and things? Yeah, I mean, I do. You know, I'm, I'm sponsored by Nike, which Nike, you know, does a really good job of just, you know, helping me out. And and, and we're getting there, you know, with other other brands and companies. And But it's not there yet. You know, now it's the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Committee. And now that Paralympians now get the same medal money bonuses as Olympians, which is a huge change. And, and the fact that they made that change is, is amazing. But now 
sponsors in return, you know, it would be amazing to step up and, and support, you know, just as much with the Paralympic movement and the Paralympic athletes and, and see that these they have really amazing stories to tell and, and, and really amazing testaments of, of overcoming adversity and these Paralympic athletes that rose and, and now on, the, on this, you know, world stage of competing at the highest level. That's just amazing to see. And you get inspired by seeing that. So we're not there yet, but I can see the trend moving in that direction. I think it's fair to say that these uh, companies like Nike have a very long way to go. You've seen a lot of the coverage in the press of how pregnant athletes are being treated, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, it's it's good that you've had a positive experience. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and that's the great thing, you know, uh, it's unfortunate how, you know, certain Issues do play out, but, you know, me with, with, with per, my personal experience, especially with the disabled community, you know, like I said, like it's, I can, I can tell it's going in the right direction. And, and at the end of the day, as long as we're, you know, as long as we're having conversation and saying, hey, it's not there yet, but we, we, we're trying to do better and we will do better. You know, that's all you can, you can ask a community or, or a company that, to do. You know, some of your fellow runners say that they're really proud to be to, to be competing against you and to be in the race with you, but there are others that are not so happy. Overall, what's been the sentiment and how have you been treated by your peers? Yeah, I mean, overall, you know, the people that I, I keep around me, of course, support me. And, and you know, I've, I've noticed like some of the, of the top runners in, in, in the world and the nation have, have nothing but love and, and support towards, towards my case and my situation. But I mean, I, I do, I have heard the chatter. Like I, people have come up to me and said people have been talking behind my back. I try to do, do my best to, to try to stay focused and, and not listen to it. But, you know, of course, you, you see the tweets and, and you see the comments. And, and I just, you know, at the end of the day, that's their opinion. Um, and and my, my goal is I, I would love the people to, to look past the blades and look at the man and, and look at my life and look at my story and look at the things that I'm trying to do and look at, look at, like, I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm not trying to take nothing away from nobody. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to cheat nobody out of nothing. I'm just trying to inspire people. And, and I'm trying to give people hope and just say, look, my situation at the beginning may sound terrible and it might, I might have been wrote off at, at, from day one being born without legs, but you know, with, with the right support system and the right belief system and, and, and the right attitude, I was able to become Olympic champion. Like, that's my, that's my message. That's, that's my story. That's what I want to do. I don't want to make people mad. I don't want to piss people off. I want to I inspire and make people happy. If, if they feel some type of way, like, I don't belong there, then that's on them. Because at the end of the day, like, we want to break these barriers. Like, there's been laws passed for disabled individuals but the reality of it is they still get treated less than. They still get looked at. They still get laughed at and they still get pointed at. The reality of it is the time is now for the change. We need to change that. Uh, Oscar Pistorius in many ways was your early uh, hero or at least your impetus for for being where you are today. But in some ways, he's a fallen hero. You know, he's serving jail time for murdering his girlfriend. When you see his potential and his promise and the role model that he was in his early years for the disabled community of athletes, how do you feel about his fall from grace? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I've watched his story closely and just, you know, the times he's taken gold and I took him silver and the times he's taken silver, I took him bronze and, and just the situation just so sad, you know, you know, the lives that, that life that was lost with Reva and the Oscars in jail and so many f the families that's affected by a decision, um, you know, the, the takeaway for me was, you know, you know, I've, I've watched him from the time he was running Paralympics all the way up years and years and years leading up to the Olympics. And then he finally got to the Olympic games and, and then it was probably, I think, less than six months after the, the Olympics and then when the, the situation happened. And it was just shocking to me how by one decision, how your life can change. It doesn't, you know, by one decision, how many, how many lives can be changed or be, be lost by one decision. And it's just, you know, it's just sad. I, and I, I pray constantly for both sides of the parties, but it's just a constant reminder to me to try to stay focused as much as possible to finish the mission. Now, you also had some struggles in 2015. You were banned for almost two years from competing yes. because there was a test, I guess, that proved positive for cocaine. What happened? <laughs> yes, yes. I was, the, the what happened was my life. I was in a, a dark place. Um, you know, I was coming off the 2012 Paralympic Games going into 2013, 2014. And, you know, I planned for the 2012 
Paralympic Games, but my issue was I did not plan after, right? I, I was so caught up with just getting there and making everybody proud and getting the mission done that I didn't have nothing planned right after. And I was searching and I was trying to find my happiness and I was in a deep, they call it the Olympic depression, but I was just in this deep, dark hole of just, not. I wasn't happy with track anymore. And, and usually remember running used to make me happy. And I, and I lost the kind of the love for it. And I call myself partying and hanging around the wrong people until I got caught and I went a week before I went partying and then I flew out to nationals and broke my American record and tested positive for cocaine from partying the week before. You're talking about a rock bottom. Um, I lost sponsorship. I lost my legs because one of my sponsorship was my leg sponsorship. So they, and they was providing me with my legs and I had a pair of legs coming on my way to help because the ones that was breaking down and they canceled that order. Oh no. It took my legs away. Yeah. It took my legs away from me. So I had to go to my closet and put and grab duct tape and just duct tape old legs together. And, and, and honestly, that was, that was a fall for grace for me. Um, you know, I was a hometown hero, you know, a lot of people and kids looked up to me in the community, especially in the disabled community and, and breaking news in Kingsport, Tennessee, Blake Lieber hometown hero tested positive for cocaine. Um, and I lost the will to run. I lost my ability to compete. The one thing that I, I love, I couldn't do anymore. And, and I had, a, had a, a, a hard conversation with myself. I'm asking myself, everything you, you've spoken through your life, and everything you've been through, what are you going to do now? And I, I tell people every single time, what I went through, being born without legs and overcoming that adversity, those same, those characteristics, I use those same characteristics to, to, to beat being suspended, to beat that addiction, to, be, to, 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 to rise above, you know what I mean, this deep, dark hole of depression I, that I was in after I was suspended, right, of staying persistent, never giving up, showing up every single day. And once I made that commitment, I moved to L.A. That's when I moved to L.A. And, and once I made that commitment, I, I, I found a new teammates, I found new trainers, I found new partners. And I, my, my whole life changed to where in 2017, I came back and, and I broke Oscar's world record. Then I broke my world record the next two years. How did you, when that happened, the cocaine thing, did you tell your, your parents and your grandpa and that it was yes. coming or did they find out on the news? No, I told them. I told them. And, and one of the hardest things to tell was my grandmother. Because um, my grandmother, she was so excited in London. Like she, I, I, I'll never forget the 400 meters. Oscar took gold and I took silver. And we're doing a victory laps um, with our flags. And, and my, my, grand, my grandmother and my grandfather got front row tickets. I gave them the front row tickets for the 400 meters seats. Because that was the two tickets I, get, I got. And I got to put my mom and dad up. But I allowed, let them see be front row. And Oscar's in front of me taking his victory lap a couple meters up. My grandmother stops him. She says, Oscar, Oscar, Oscar. And he, and he stops and looks at her. He's like, I'm, I'm Blake Leaper's grandmother, and he's going to beat you next time. <laughs> and she tells, she says that to him in this victory lap, right? And so she goes back home, and, 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 and she's so excited about just this trip, and she's telling, showing her, her friends all the pictures and, and, the, and how amazing it was. And she's like, I'm getting ready for, for Rio. I'm going to get ready for Rio. Like, I'm so excited. I'm going to get my shots. I'm getting ready. And in 2015, of course, I tested test the positive and, and I, I lost my ability to go to Rio like I, I couldn't go and that next year in 2016 my grandmother passed away due to cancer and and I promised her that I would go like I was she, she would ask me like we're going to go to Rio we're going to go to Rio and I told her over and yeah of course we're going to go and then the funeral I had to look at her and and, and, and try to make that amends like that mistake that I made and I, and I, I went over it was it worth it the question I kept asking myself was it worth it was it worth it was it worth it? And every answer, every answer, I say, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And I had, I had to feel that, right? That I, I couldn't fulfill my promise to my grandmother because I wanted to go have fun or I, I couldn't stay focused. So I, I promised myself I would never, ever be in that situation again. I'm never, ever going to feel that feeling ever again. Because that feeling of, of letting someone in like that in my life down is tough. But I'm, I'm going to use that. And I needed that to, to make this change in my life to be the best human being, to be the best man that I possibly can be. And you talked a little bit about that in uh, when you recently took part in that Netflix show, Awake, <laughs> in which contestants are being made to like stay awake for 24 hours and you're counting coins and then you're doing all these silly and challenging tests, but then you have to guess the number of coins they've counted, you've counted and 
you know, if you get close to the actual amount, then you get to take that money home and you won yes. $191,000. Yes, I did. <laughs> Which is crazy. And I tell people, you know, the crazy thing about it, when people, a lot of people don't know, I wasn't even supposed to be on that show. I was supposed to be competing in Brazil at a track meet that I already signed up that my track agent was supposed to get me in. And even though I auditioned for the show and made it through all the rounds in my head, I was like, I'm going to go to Brazil, but I'll go through the rounds just in case. And right before I was supposed to go to Brazil, I got a letter from the IAAF saying I have an unfair advantage that shut my season down. And once that shut my season down, it opened up my schedule to participate on the show that I didn't even know I was going to win that much. I had no clue there was even that much money on the line. And I walked away winning $191,000. <laughs> and, and what did you say to the, the host of the show when, when he asked you your motivations for doing it? Um, it was just, you know, having confidence. That was just an amazing thing. Like I was, once again, I was the only disabled person there on the show and I was there battling and, and fighting and, and using my tools that I've learned you know being born without legs and applying that to this show to win money and I was just trying to show people that even though you have a disability that even though you're facing hard challenges like you can still show up and fight you can still show up and have confidence you still can show up and win the big bank the, win the big money I mean I'm pretty sure lined up odds was probably against me the guy would know you know the guy missing both his legs probably is not going to do so good and I ended up beating everybody. Like, that's my message right there. If you show up and fight, miracles happen. It was kind of funny when in your first test where you had to remove the batteries out of those clattering monkeys and you said, hey, you know, I'm really good with a screwdriver because I use it every day for my prosthetics. And you won that. You won that challenge. Right. And I won that challenge. I'm telling you, it was like, it was like fate. You no, know, because you've been up for 24 hours. Like, you're, you're, you're just, your mind is all over the place. You know, your hands are shaking. Your hand-eye coordination is off. And so I just go, you know, back to, okay, Blake, if you're putting your leg together, what do you do? And then I list lefty-loosey. And, and, and if I was in a rush in a basketball game or in a track meet, my leg was coming loose, how would you do it? Find the rhythm. And I just go to just the bare basics of how I live my life, and I applied that to the game, and it, and it worked out for me. <laughs> And you were also smart enough to to walk away from the option to wager that hundred and ninety thousand dollars against the big million dollar game prize. And and you were funny. You said, you know, my mama didn't raise me stupid. You know, I'm going to take yeah. this money. So overall, except for your cocaine thing, I mean, you've shown both extreme competitiveness and extreme good judgment, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, other than that little hiccup in my life, I felt like I have. And and honestly, with, with, like with that hiccup. It's probably the, I wouldn't say the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was, it was a beautiful thing that I had to rise and grow from. And, and, and the lesson, you know, that I learned, my, one of my favorite quotes is, it's like a Rocky quote. And it's like, life is not how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. It's about how hard you can take hits and keep pushing through the adversity. And I was hit pretty hard through with life. And, and I was able to, to push through and show life and show God that I'm not going to give up. And I feel like the Netflix was just, you know, the universe rewarded me of just saying, you didn't give up in that moment. And even though things are not going the way you want it right now, this is just a testimony and a testament to let you know to keep pushing through. And as long as you keep fighting, doors are going to keep falling down and miracles are going to keep happening. What did you do with the money? Saved it. <laughs> no, I actually, so I put it up. I'm, I'm, I'm bought a car and, and I'm, I'm going to get an apartment, but honestly, it's going, it's going to train. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting it up. I'm, my, my goal and my focus is, you know, going into the Olympic games and, and I, and I know it's not going to be cheap and I know it's not going to be easy and, and, and I, I will not stop till I'm there. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting that money up and I'm, I'm reinvesting it into myself to, to be the fastest man in the world. That's exactly what I'm doing with it. I'm setting my life to, to produce the, the best product I possibly can produce next year in 2020 at the Olympic Games. Blake, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And, and again, thank you for allowing me to share my story and allow me to tell my side of it. <laughs> Blake Leeper was born without legs, but blessed with a fearless and competitive spirit. He's an eight-time Paralympic track and field international medalist. He holds a number of world records, including becoming the sixth fastest runner in the world in the 400-meter dash. He's now fighting to be accepted into the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Thank you for listening to When It Mattered. 
Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. When It Mattered is a weekly leadership podcast produced by Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups find their narrative. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions. Our theme song is composed by Jack Yeagerlein. Join us next week for another edition of When It Mattered. I'll see you then.